any measures to become a republic in the short term after the death of the Queen, although she expects a Pacific nation will eventually become one. New Zealand is one of the 15 realms to count the British monarch as the head of state, including Australia and Canada, although the role is largely ceremonial. But there's been debate for some time now whether the Pacific nation should become a republic with a citizen as the head of state. The Queen is our head of state and we've lost our head of state and we now uh, have gone through the formal procedure to acknowledge our new head of state, King Charles III. And so this will offer an opportunity both to pay respects on behalf of New Zealand to our serving sovereign of over of, of 70 years. It would also be a chance to connect with uh, uh, those in the wider family as part of the events across the course of the week. There's been a, a, a debate probably for a, a number of years. Uh, it's just the pace and uh, uh, how widely uh, that debate is occurring. I, I've made my view plain many times. Uh, I do believe that is where New Zealand um, uh, will head in time. I believe it's likely to occur in my lifetime, uh, but I don't see it as a short-term uh, measure or anything that is that is on the agenda anytime soon. No. As I say, in large part actually, because I've never sensed an urgency. Uh, there's so many challenges we face. This is a large, significant debate. I don't think it's one that would or should occur quickly. In other news now, Pope Francis uh, is in Kazakhstan for the start of a three-day trip to attend a peace meeting of world religious leaders. Kazakh President Kasim Jomat Tokayev greeted the Pope briefly at the airport before the Pope travelled in a small white car to the gleaming marble presidential palace. A private meeting with the head of state ahead of an address to government officials at the diplomatic corps. The Pope was wheeled into the palace in a wheelchair due to the ongoing knee ailments and was welcomed to the presidential palace with pomp and ceremony. Speaking to reporters accompanying him on his flight to the Central Asian Republic, Pope Francis asked whether, was asked whether he might meet Chinese President Xi Jinping in its capital, Nur Sultan, where both men will be tomorrow. Pope Francis has tried to ease the historically poor relations between the Holy See and China and told reporters uh, that he hoped to renew a secret and contested agreement on the appointment of Roman Catholic bishops in China. The Armenian government says at least 49 of its soldiers have been killed in clashes along the border with Azerbaijan following a sharp escalation in hostilities, prompting Russia and the United States to call for restraint. The escalation of decades-old hostilities between the South Caucasus, uh, Caucasus and countries has fueled fears that a second fully-fledged war could break out in the post-Soviet world in addition to Russia's ongoing military actions in Ukraine. Armenia says several towns near the border with Azerbaijan, including Yemuk, Goris and Kapan, were being shelled in the early hours of today, and it responded to what it called a large-scale provocation by Azerbaijan. The Armenian Prime Minister has accused Azerbaijan of attacking Armenian towns because it did not want to negotiate over the status of Nagorno-Karabakh, an enclave which is inside Azerbaijan but mainly populated by ethnic Armenians. Azerbaijan, which accused Armenia of carrying out intelligence activity along the border and moving weapons, says its military positions came under attack by Armenia, according to the media. Well, speaking of Russia's intervention, the Kremlin says that Russian President Vladimir Putin is doing what he can to help de-escalate the hostilities between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskyov told reporters it is difficult to overestimate the role of Russia and the role of Putin personally. In mediating between the two countries, the president is making every effort to contribute to the de-escalation of tensions on the border. These efforts are continuing. Turkey, on the other hand, says it will continue to stand by Azerbaijan. Assurance came from Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlot Kavasoglu. He says Ankara's relations with Armenia are not independent of Yerevan Baku ties. He told reporters earlier, an opportunity emerged to maintain peace and stability. In fact, we say every crisis comes with an opportunity. But instead of choosing this option, Armenia constantly provokes Azerbaijan 
Last night, they were engaged in provocation again, again on the border and beloved Azerbaijan gave the necessary answer. They should take their lesson. <laughs> To the full-blown war in Ukraine now, President Volodymyr Zelensky says his forces have retaken 6,000 square kilometers of Russian-held territory since the beginning of the month. In his regular nightly video address, he told citizens, since the beginning of September and up to today, our fighters have liberated more than 6,000 square kilometers of the territory of Ukraine in the south and in the east. The advances of our forces continue. Now, on Sunday, Ukrainian Chief Commander General Valery Zaluzhny said his troops have retaken more than 3,000 square kilometers this month as thousands of Russian troops pulled back following Ukraine's gains, leaving behind ammunition and equipment. Russia fired missiles at power stations on Sunday, causing blackouts in the Kharkiv and adjacent Poltava and Sumy regions. Ukraine denounced the strikes as retaliation again. But well, Ukraine's Deputy Defense Minister Hanna Malia says fighting is still raging in Ukraine's northeast Kharkiv region, but that Ukraine's forces are making good progress because its forces are highly motivated and its operation is well planned. Malia was speaking on the road to Balaklia, a crucial military supply hub recaptured by Ukrainian forces late last week. During a counteroffensive that forced Russian troops to flee further east. Balaklia is 74 kilometers southeast of Kharkiv, the country's the regional capital, and Ukraine's second largest city. Russia, which still controls around a fifth of the country following its invasion on February 24, has responded to Kyiv's battlefield successes by shelling power stations and other key infrastructure causing blackouts in Kharkiv and elsewhere. Both Russia and Ukraine are in contact with the International Atomic Energy Agency working team on the establishment of a nuclear safety and security protection zone around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. That's according to the Director General of the United Nations Nuclear Watchdog, Rafael Grossi, during a press conference on Monday. Russia and Ukraine have blamed each other for shelling at the site of the nuclear power plant that has damaged its facilities, including cutting power lines essential in avoiding a nuclear accident. Grossi has called both countries for immediate to stop the shelling immediately and a more formal nuclear safety security protection zone to be established around the plant. But the United Nations International Organization for Migration says any damage inflicted on Ukraine's power and heating systems will seriously exacerbate living conditions this winter, especially for an estimated 6.9 million internally displaced people in Ukraine. The IOM's top priority this winter in Ukraine is ensuring the access of internally displaced people to heating, warm clothes and food. As many as 8 million people, mostly women and children, have fled Ukraine in the past six months. Some of those people have since returned to Ukraine, which had a pre previous population of around 44 million. We see a spontaneous movement of return. Return from other oblasts to the oblasts of, of origin, so intern, internal displacement. And we see also returns, uh, spontaneous returns from European countries back to Ukraine. Uh, we anticipate that, uh, uh, of course, the winter will have an impact in these uh, movements because it becomes much more difficult to move during winter. So when we speak about cities, we are speaking about eating uh, processes based on gas, and on electricity. And any attempt and damage and of those facilities will have a terrible impact in the capacity to eat the cities. And uh, uh, we uh, are doing all our efforts to um, assist the populations in preparing uh, for the winter, but we need the electricity. And uh, we, that depends on the uh, state uh, services to uh, put back working uh, the electricity. The electricity. We have seen in the press uh, several reports about uh, uh, Ukrainians that uh, have uh, been um, uh, sent to Russia 
but uh, uh, we do not have access. We do not have access to the uh, Russian uh, side of the border, and therefore we cannot confirm uh, figures. We know just what are the figures that have been uh, uh, public, uh, made publicly available by the Ministry of Defense of Russia. History was made in Kenya today as President William Ruto was sworn in as the nation's fifth leader. Tens of thousands of people cheered as he was sworn in at the ceremony in the capital, Nairobi, following his narrow election win last month. Mr. Ruto hailed it as a moment like no other, adding that a village boy had become president. A former deputy president was handed a copy of Kenya's constitution and a sword to represent the transfer of power from President Uhuru Kenyatta. And with his hand on a Bible, the 55-year-old swore to preserve and protect the Constitution. Nairobi's 60,000 capacity international stadium was filled before dawn. Many spectators were clad in yellow, the color of William Ruto's party, as they gathered to witness him being sworn into office as Kenya's fifth president. With his hand on a Bible, the 55-year-old swore to preserve and protect the Constitution. I, I, William Samoei Ruto, in full realization, in full realization of the high calling, of the high calling, I assume as president, I assume as president of Kenya, of the Republic of Kenya, who swear that I will be faithful, that I will be faithful, and bear true allegiance, and bear true allegiance, to the Republic of Kenya, to the Republic of Kenya, and that I will protect, and uphold, and uphold, the sovereignty, the sovereignty, integrity, integrity, and dignity, and dignity of the people of Kenya. Of the people of Kenya. So help me God. So help me God. Many African leaders, such as Nigeria's Vice President, Professor Yamil Shibajo, and Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni, among others, graced the occasion. Ruto, a former roadside chicken seller, who is now a wealthy businessman, campaigned as challenger to the powerful families that have dominated Kenyan politics since independence in 1963. The President of the Republic of Kenya, Tumpogeze Kwamakofi. This moment is a moment like no other. By the grace of God, we have got here. And let me say, that standing here today is testimony that there is a God in heaven. And today, I want to thank God because a village boy has become the president of Kenya. I want to thank my wife and family for always praying for me and praying for my team. Deputy President for the last decade, Ruto must now confront an economic crisis in East Africa's wealthiest and most stable nation, where food and fuel prices are surging, unemployment is high, and public debt rising. The 55-year-old won last month's election despite a public repudiation by his boss, outgoing President Uhuru Kenyatta, who said Ruto was not fit for office.
Kenyatta's preferred successor, veteran opposition leader Raila Odinga, did not attend the inauguration ceremony, saying he did not believe the election was free and fair. This is despite the fact that the Supreme Court handed down a unanimous judgment confirming Mr. Ruto's victory and dismissing Mr. Odinga's concerns a week ago. Many Kenyans wanted to witness the moment the United Democratic Alliance candidate would officially be sworn in. However, the venue could not host everyone. Scores of people were crushed and injured as they forced their way into the stadium. Many of the wounded were rushed to Nairobi's main hospital afterward. We'll have more on uh, the celebrations in Kenya later on, uh, including uh, London, a watch for tributes uh, to the Queen. Check this one out. It's a, uh, a morale painting of the Queen. It's all after the break. Welcome back. Thousands of Kenyans today watched uh, President William Ruto be sworn in as the country's fifth leader. Earlier, my colleague, Jessalayo uh, Olarinde, spoke to Kenyan journalist Abi Agina about the atmosphere and the people's feelings towards the new administration. There's excitement really across the country with the majority of Kenyans celebrating this uh, momentous occasion, even as uh, William Ruto ascended to the presidency, being the fifth president of the Republic of Kenya. Well, of course, uh, the opposition leader, Raila Odinga, was conspicuously missing, as well as uh, running with Martha Karua, which, of course, uh, did uh, not over too well with those who are behind uh, this uh, event, the, the planners, actually. But uh, as it stands, the country is looking forward to his first 100 days, which a uh, majority of Kenyans will be waiting with them with bated breath just to see what will he do different. To someone who basically represents the aspirations of many Kenyans who have been yearning to see one of their own rising to their top office, his story was literally an area of focus in his speech where he did exude confidence that the Kenya of today is a country where anyone can pursue their dreams and become at the rise to the highest level in the, in, the, in the land. Well, among the other areas of interest in his speech definitely were fixing the economy. Remember, Kenya's economy hasn't been running pretty well, especially since COVID struck. We've seen uh, Economic headwinds affect the economic performance. Um, looking at inflation right now, we are talking about 8.5% inflation. We've also seen um, the Kenyan shilling weakening against the US dollar, trading at just about 150 shillings to the greenback. And all this has, of course, uh, left many households devastated with high food prices and high fare prices which I also did see fuel prices being an area of focus in his speech. He talked about uh, subsidies, saying the subsidies are no longer tenable, and uh, he will be, of course, uh, suspending the subsidies. We currently have a subsidy program running for fuel, which has been able to push on Kenyans from the high rises of fuel. Abi Agina in Nairobi, Kenya. To so updates on the floods in Pakistan now, some workers at a railway station say they are struggling with train services suspended following the floods that have ravaged swathes of the South Asian nation. Uh, one of them, who's an owner of a tea store at the station, says he's had to ask his child to drink a glass of water for breakfast with a lack of passengers leaving him without any income. Pakistan Railways have said the resumption of passenger trains operations would depend on the receding of water over and along the rail tracks. Floods from record monsoon rains and glacial melt in the mountainous north have affected 33 million people, killed almost 1,400, washing away homes, roads, railways, livestock, crops, and, damaging, and, and damages left behind estimated at $30 billion. In neighboring India, at least eight people have been killed, 11 others injured, following a fire which started at an electric scooter showroom in the country. According to the police, the latest fire broke out late on Monday in a hotel basement, housing the showroom with some two dozen electric scooters in the southern city of Secunderabad. 
It has said it had been brought under control and an investigation has been launched. A spate of electric scooter fires this year has alarmed the government, which is keen to promote use of such two-wheelers in its fight against pollution. However, early investigations have identified faulty battery cells and battery models among the many causes. In the United States, the Los Angeles Department of Public Health has attributed a resident's death to monkeypox infections, the first known death from the virus in the country. The department said it has confirmed the resident died because of monkeypox in a press release and joint verification with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It reads that the, state, that the resident was severely immunocompromised and had been hospitalized and in that to protect confidentiality and privacy additional information on the case will not be made public on august 30 the u.s southern state of texas reported the death of a person diagnosed with monkeypox but local health officials said it was too early to say for sure what role monkeypox played in the death and as of monday a total of 21,985 monkeypox cases have been reported nationwide in the United States. Meanwhile, uh, rapper PNB Rock was shot and killed during a robbery at a Los Angeles restaurant on Monday. The performer, best known for his song Selfish, was shot at Roscoe's House of Chicken and Waffles in the afternoon. He was accompanied by his girlfriend, Stephanie Subuang. According to Los Angeles police, one suspect came and approached them with a firearm and demanded the victim's property. It was some sort of verbal exchange. The suspect shot the victim several times. The victim then fell to the ground and the suspect removed some items from him. The police have not confirmed the victim's identity, but many media in the U.S. are identifying the victim as the rapper. 29-year-old Rakim Allen, also known by his stage name PNB Brock, PNB Rock, reference to Pastorus and Bainton, two streets in the Philadelphia neighborhood where Allen grew up. Well, this weekend was the Emmys, and there were a few winners. Amongst them were Brett Goldstein, who landed his second Emmy Award on Monday for playing a foul-mouthed, but soft-hearted soccer star on Ted Lasso. I think of myself Sherry Lou Raff was honored for her role as a veteran teacher color. in the comedy in Abbott the Elementary. The actors were among the early winners at the Emmy Awards, Hollywood's annual celebration of the best of television. We're very, you know, we're quite a close. I think of myself as an artist, as a woman, especially as a woman of color. I'm an endangered species, but I don't sing any victim song. I'm a woman. I'm an artist, and I know where my voice belongs. And there's so many young actors, artists, even kids that think they know what they're going to do in life. Find your voice and put it where it belongs. There's a great big old watch party taking place in Kingston, Jamaica right now, and the whole island is watching because in October I go back and my name will change because I will become the Honorable Cheryl Lee Ralph, Order of Jamaica. It's like getting the Medal of Honor and an Emmy too. Really hot woman, isn't it? And finally, on the program across London today, mourners have been paying their respects as they have in the past few days to Queen Elizabeth II, with thousands of tributes pouring in from flowers to street art. One of them is this one, uh, as people have been stopping by to take pictures as chalk artist Julian Beaver creates a portrait of the Queen on the pavements of uh, Trafalgar Square. Meanwhile, in Green Park, thousands of flowers and cards have been left behind by well-wishers. The Queen's coffin will be arriving in London tomorrow morning for another line in stays. Londoners will have an opportunity to say their final goodbyes to the Queen. Queen Elizabeth II died on Thursday, September 8th, in a home in Balmoral Castle in the Scottish Highlands. She was aged 96, and she reigned for more than 70 years. And that's the world today. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Thanks for watching.